Just before we get started, did you know that I've got a podcast? It's called The Brain Food Show, and it covers topics similar to what we do here at Today I Found Out, but it's in a longer form, more podcasty format. I co host it with Davin, who you sometimes see presenting on this channel. It's a lot of fun. It runs for about an hour, so it's a bit more of a commitment than a short video like this one. But if you like this show, you'll probably like it. Just search Brain Food, one word, wherever you get your podcasts, and you will find it. On the Samana range of the Hindu Kush mountains in Pakistan, the British Army built a small communications post at Saragahi to be housed by an equally small contingent of soldiers. The region had always been a troubled area, and during the last quarter of the 19th century, British India's hold on the northwest frontier was a bit tenuous. In fact, several expeditions had been sent to maintain control and suppress rebellion in the region in the years immediately preceding the Saragahi battle. Saragahi itself was little more than a small blockhouse and a signaling tower. It was constructed to enable communications between Fort Lockhart and Fort Gullistan, two more significant British posts situated on either side of the Saragahi, albeit several miles apart. Equipped with a heliograph, Saragahi transmitted messages by using flashes of sunlight sent much like Morse code. The flashes themselves were made by either pivoting a mirror or interrupting a beam of light. In the summer of 1897, things were getting tense in the region, and the British had only recently entered an uprising of Pashtun tribesmen in the Malakand region, known later as the Siege of Malakand, in early August. By the end of the month, there was a general uprising of Afghans, and by the beginning of September, Pashtuns were actively attempting to capture British Army positions, including attacks on Fort Gulliston on September the 3rd and September the 9th. To combat the Pashtun offences, troops were sent from Fort Lockhart to reinforce Fort Gulliston, and after the battle on the 9th, on their return trip, a few soldiers were left to reinforce the small detachment at Saragahi. All of the 21 soldiers remaining at Saragari were members of the 36th Sikh regiments of the British Army, and the contingent was led by Havildar Ishar Singh. On September 12, 1897, in an effort to prevent any further communications between Forts Lockhart and Gulliston, 10,000 Pashtuns attacked Saragahi, beginning at about 9 a.m. Since Saragahi was communications post, almost the entire battle was broadcast in real time by its signalman, Sardar Gurmukh Singh. Which is why today we know exactly what happened there when 21 faced off against around 10,000. Shortly after the attack began, Gurmukh Singh signaled for aid to Lieutenant Colonel John Horton at Fort Lockhart, but he was told that immediate help was unavailable. Undeterred, the Sikh soldiers committed to fighting to the last to prevent the encroaching Pashtuns from reaching the other forts. The first man injured was Bhagwan Singh, and sometime after, the invaders broke part of the wall of the picket. Offers were made to the Sikhs in exchange for surrender, but they were refused. The Sikhs were trying to buy as much time as possible for the other forts to be reinforced, and were willing to pay for that time with their lives. After two unsuccessful attempts at the gates, the Pashtun forces eventually breached the wall. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting ensued. Shortly before the end, Ishar Singh ordered his men to retreat even further while he remained behind in defense. He too fell during that charge, as did all the remaining soldiers, except for the heliograph operator, Gurmukh Singh. Gurmukh was the last to die after being burned to death when the Pashtuns set fire to the post. He is reported to have repeatedly yelled until the end the Sikh battle cry, Bola so nahal sat shi ahal, meaning, shout aloud in ecstasy, true is the great timeless one. Absolutely no idea if I got the pronunciation right on that, but there we go. Although no Sikh survived the battle, their sacrifice sufficiently delayed the Pashtuns such that reinforcements were able to arrive at the Pashtuns' ultimate target, Fort Gulliston, and that prevented its fall. In addition to the 21 Sikh dead, reports of Pashtun losses range from between 180 to 600, though it's difficult to discern the true number accurately. That said, it was probably at least 180, as that is what the Pashtuns themselves later reported as their loss in that battle. For their sacrifice, each of the Sikh soldiers were awarded the Indian Order of Merit, the highest award for gallantry, then given to Indian soldiers by the British. In addition, Saragahi Day is celebrated each year on September the 12th to commemorate the battle. And now for some bonus facts. Here comes the dots is an anagram of the Morse code. Say so that's the thing you now spent a few seconds of your life learning that will no doubt serve you very well in the future. You're absolutely welcome. We know it's why you come here. Speaking of Morse code and distress, have 
ever wonder what the SOS signal actually stands for? It stands for Save Our Souls, right? Well, want to know more? First created and adopted as the Universal International Distress Signal at the 1906 Berlin Radio Telegraphic Conference, it has commonly been held since that SOS is an acronym for Save Our Ship, and oh, okay, <laughs> and thus written S.O.S. In truth, SOS is not an acronym for anything, which is why it is incorrect to put full stops between each letter. Well, there you have it. So why was SOS chosen to signify a distress signal? The thought was that SOS in Morse code signified by three dots, three dashes, and then three dots could not be misinterpreted as being a message for anything else. Further, being sent together as one string with no stops, it could be sent very quickly and needs very little power to transmit. So despite what you might have read elsewhere as the 1918 Marconi Yearbook of Wireless Telegraphy and Telephony notes, Sounds like a thrilling read. <laughs> this signal SOS was adopted simply on account of its easy radiation and its unmistakable character. There is no special significance in the letters themselves. Incidentally, the creator of the SOS cleaning pad's wife was one that thought that the SOS signal stood for Save Our Ships, which inspired her to name her husband's cleaning pad's SOS standing for Save Our Saucepans. It's also noteworthy here that this soap-encrusted steel wool product's genesis is one of many that started out as a free sample, which pan salesman Ed Cox, the company's founder, would give to customers who were interested in buying pans that he was selling. Soon he was getting so many requests for his soapy steel wool pads that he decided to start a company selling them instead of selling pans. Final bonus fact today. Have you ever wondered why people on planes and ships may also use the word mayday when in extreme distress? Well, wonder no more. In 1923, a senior radio officer, Frederick Stanley Mockford in Croydon Airport in London, England, was asked to think of one word that would be easy to understand for all pilots and ground staff in the event of an emergency. The problem had arisen as voice radio communication slowly became more common. So, an equivalent to the Morse code SOS distress signal was needed. Obviously, a word like help wasn't a good choice for English speakers because it could be used in normal conversations where no one was in distress. At the time, Mockford was considering the request. Much of the traffic he was dealing with was between Croydon and Le Bourget Airport in France. With both the French and English languages in mind, he came up with the somewhat unique word mayday, the anglicized spelling of the French pronunciation of the word madir, which means help me. Four years later, in 1927, the International Radio Telegraph Convention of Washington made May Day the official voice distress call used only to communicate the most serious level of distress, such as with life-threatening emergencies. When using May Day in a distress call, it is traditional to repeat it three times in a row. May Day, May Day, May Day. This is to make sure it is easily distinguished from a message about a May Day call and from any similar sounding phrases in noisy conditions. In situations where a vessel requires assistance, not from great in immediate danger, a distress call of Pan Pan can be used instead. Essentially, it means you need aid, but you don't need support personnel to necessarily drop what they're doing right that instance and come and help you as you would need with a mayday. Like mayday, Pan Pan is the anglicized spelling of a French word, in this case Pane, which means broken, failure, breakdown. Also, as with mayday, one should state it three consecutive times, Pan Pan, Pan Pan, Pan Pan, followed by which stations you are addressing and your last known location, nature of your emergency, etc. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you'd like more from me, definitely check out that podcast, The Brain Food Show. Just search Brain Food wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for watching.